Okay, I don't want to talk about you and God for a second. I don't want to talk about you and your neighbor. Here's what I want to talk about. The tension between how much you plan and how much you trust in God's plans. Right? How much do you schedule, set goals, put on paper, pursue? Let's talk about your plans. And then let's talk about God's plans. There's a question that has caused me more confusion and frustration and tension as a pastor than almost any other. And when I share this question with you, you might think it's a joke and you might seem it's small, but I'm, I'm being absolutely serious when I say it. The question is this. Should a pastor like me hug people like you? <laughs> Amen. All right. I guess we're done for today. <laughs> you know, when I was growing up, pastors wore robes and they stood up in pulpits and they were, you know, professional theologians. The answer to that question was really easy. You don't hug your pastor. You shake his hand before you go to the parking lot and head out to brunch. And when I was going through Bible college and seminary, that's kind of what I thought too. You know, I want to be a, a nice pastor and a warm pastor, but it's a, a calling. It's a position of authority and respect. And maybe like a police officer or a professor in college. You want to be, want to be warm and approachable, but it's not like your buddy, and so a handshake is the, the right thing to do. And so I think for the first five, six, maybe even seven years of my ministry, that's exactly what I did. I stood at the door, I tried to love people, preach the word of God, and shake their hands before we said goodbye. But then one gentleman came through the line, uh, a retired pastor, and uh, he and his wife, I actually remember where I was standing at my old church, and he, he challenged my thinking, and here's what he said. He said, I waited way too long as a pastor to hug people, which got my attention. He said, honestly, Mike, you know what I do. This is not like giving a lecture. This is not like making a judgment in a courtroom. We are involved in the most emotional moments of people's lives, right? A, a baby's born, you tell the pastor. A baptism happens, you call the pastor. A marriage is falling apart and it's a crisis counseling, you reach out to the pastor. Literally, pastors stand between a man and a woman when they take the vows of one of the biggest decisions of their life. It's like the three of us up there. We're there at people's gravesides and hospital beds. We ride the ups and the downs. This isn't like closing a business deal with a firm handshake. This is much more personal, much more relatable than that. And so the pastor said, handshakes, if you have to. But, but the ministry, the relationship between a pastor and the people of his church is, is so much better. It's so much closer than that. And so I changed. Uh, back in 2014, a handful of you were here. I came to this church. I thought it was a fresh start. So I said, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to hug people. So <laughs> we actually made a funny video about it. I said, hey, if it makes you uncomfortable, I'll stick with the handshake. But otherwise, like the normal greeting is going to be a hug around here. And for years, that's exactly what I did. Until, until two things happened. Neither of them are scandalous or, you know, nothing went really wrong. Um, I was counseling this couple whose marriage was just a mess. And uh, they would be divorced before the end of the year. And, you know, I did my best and we prayed and we talked. And at the end of the conversation, we said goodbye like we normally did. I hugged him and then I hugged her. But as I did, this thought popped into my mind. I wonder how long it's been since this guy has hugged his own wife. Right? They were so distant. The marriage had grown so cold. And here I am, literally in front of this guy, hugging the woman he probably doesn't hug anymore. And something about that, you know, just didn't, didn't sit right with me. Not long after that, the Me Too movement happened. And as I heard stories from actresses and people in businesses, I, I learned something that actually I'd never thought about before. I learned that sometimes it's hard to speak up and say you're uncomfortable when you're with a, a person who has a position of authority. I mean, I'd always just operated like, hey, if you're uncomfortable, let me know. That's fine. Right? But for some people, it's not so easy to say I'm uncomfortable. Sometimes when the, the pastor 
is approaching you. And I thought, man, I would never, ever, 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 ever want someone to come to this church and feel pressured like into physical contact with the pastor. That's, that's just foul to me. And because some of you know this about me, I'm really bad at kind of like nuanced gray area situations. I, I reverted. I, actually, I think I actually confused a whole bunch of you. Like I backed off from the hugs. I went back to the handshakes. And now here, years later, I have no clue what I'm doing. Because <laughs> I, like I, I, I feel the pull of both of those things, right? I, don't, I just want to be a professional who preaches sermons and gets paid and goes home. Like I want to be there for the ups and the downs with you. And, and also, I want everyone in this place to not feel threatened, to not feel pressured, to feel totally safe when they step into the space. So why am I telling you all of this? I was trying to think of a way to have the most awkward interaction at the doors before we leave church today, all right? <laughs> it's just going to be weird. Let's prepare ourselves for that, all right? Now, I wanted to share that story with you because here's something I've learned about life. It's a difficult part about life. It's the messy and complicated part, but it's an absolutely true part about life. And I want you to write this down. If you're watching at home, I want you to write this down too. I want you to know that truth is a tension. Like, the, the right thing to do, the best thing to do, the God thing to do, is often not just one point. It's two valid points that you hold in tension. Should a pastor hug people? Yeah or no? If you're going to get it right, you have to remember both those things at the same time. And I'm telling you that because you don't have to be a pastor to feel that. There's so many times in life where the decision that you have to make, the way you relate with people or with God, you can't just stop at one thing that's true. You have to remember all the things that are true. All right, this happens to a lot of us when we uh, see a homeless person outside of church. Do you, do you reach into your pocket, your purse, and give them money? Well, on the one hand, yeah, Christians want to be the most generous giving people because God's the most generous Giving Father. On the other hand, we don't want to enable bad behavior. Isn't it better just to donate to organizations that help with homelessness? That's a, that's a real tension. Or your best friend or your roommate or your kid is like really deep into a drug addiction and now they need help and they need a place to stay and they're asking you for money. What do you do? Well, you want to be the most patient and kind and giving person as a follower of Jesus and, and you've heard of the word enabling before, and sometimes people have to hit bottom before they change and they have to reap what they've sown and feel the consequences of their own actions. How are you going to love someone in that situation? It's not just pick one or the other. It's holding those two things in tension. Should you forgive someone who's hurt you? Yes, more than once. Jesus said 70 times, seven times you should forgive them. But if someone is manipulative and abusive and dangerous, should you cut ties and keep your distance? Is that the Christian thing to do? Sometimes, yes, it is. The Proverbs say, run away from fools and violent, dangerous people. So if you're going to get God right, if you're going to get the Christian life right, you can't just listen to one thing, say amen, and go on your merry way. You have to be willing to get into the midst of these tense, difficult, nuanced moments. Now, I was thinking we should probably have a whole sermon series about that, the tension of truth. Um, but today, as long as I have your attention, I want to I take that concept and I want to apply it to something very, very specifically. Okay, I don't want to talk about you and God for a second. I don't want to talk about you and your neighbor. Here's what I want to talk about. The tension between how much you plan and how much you trust in God's plans. Right? How much do you schedule, set goals, put on paper, pursue? Let's talk about your plans. And then let's talk about God's plans. All right, well, real quick survey. If there was a line between people who plan things, you know, have a calendar, boxes to check, New Year's resolutions, and people who are totally not that, like go with the flow, whatever, you know, God has a plan anyway. If you had to pick one or the other, I'm really curious, where are my planners at? Where are my box checking? Goal setters, if you're sitting next to one, you can point at them right now. 
Yes. They probably asked you to check the calendar this morning before you came to church. All right, that's how I am. And those of us who are like that, what we would say is, well, of course you should. God's given you this life, these resources. Don't, don't just wing it. Don't waste it. If he's given you like first world money and an American paycheck, he did not give that to you to just see what happens. Make a plan for your heart, your soul, your family, your finances. There, there's something you're, you're going to fail if you don't like plan from the start. So you really should. But, but where are my uh, not planners at? No. Have you ever had to say to a, a very planning person in your house, take a deep breath? <laughs> All right, he is a God of peace and of rest <laughs> and of joy, and you don't have it right now because this box did not get checked. Like, you just made up your own list of things to do, and there's a God who has a different list of things to do. He has good works planned for you to do that aren't on your list. So why, why are you worrying about your goals when you don't know the future? You don't know today. You don't know tomorrow. Why not just, like, set back, take a deep breath, and let Jesus take the wheel? Which makes sense. <laughs> so the big question for today is, well, what kind of person should you be? Should you be a person who is like ruthless and radical and driven about planning your schedule, your life? Or should you be a person who's just so trusting, so faithful that you, you just wait to see where God takes you? Let's find an answer today as we open up our Bibles to Esther chapter 7. Verse 1 says this. So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet. And as they were drinking wine on the second day, the king again asked, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. And Queen Esther answered, If I've found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition. And spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, Who is he? Where is he? The man who has dared to do such a thing. Esther said, An adversary, an enemy, this vile Haman. Oh, can you picture his face? <laughs> then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. The king got up in a rage, left his wine, and went out into the palace garden. But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Did you catch that? Someone's trying to kill your wife, husband. Someone's trying to rid me of my life. Someone is trying to destroy and annihilate my people. And Xerxes is so furious. He says, who? Let me at him. Where, where is this man? And then Esther plans the perfect punchline, doesn't she? Oh, yes, honey, he is an enemy. He is an adversary. He is, boom. Esther's like a coach who's called the timeout, drawn up the play, and then ran it to perfection. She planned the time, she planned the place, she planned the script, she planned her attitude, she planned the conclusion. And guess what happens? Even Haman, the vile enemy, knows that the plan's going to work. Right? And all the type A planning people in church joined their voices and they said, Amen, you see, we were right. We were right. Turn to a hippie next to you and say, I was right, right? <laughs> That's why we keep a planner. It's in the book of Esther, honey. Let's sit down with our calendars after uh, breakfast is over, right? <laughs> All right, well, but, but wait. But wait, before we get excited, that's absolutely true. Isn't it? Esther wasn't winging it. She didn't go in cold, just waiting for the Holy Spirit to guide her words. She had a very specific plan, and, and the chapter isn't over. Jump back in at verse 8. It says, Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining to beg for his life. 
The king exclaimed, will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house? As soon as the word left the king's mouth, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs attending the king, said, a pole reaching to a height of 50 cubits, 75 feet, stands by Haman's house. Haman set it up for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. The king said, impale him on it. So they impaled Haman on the pole he had set up for Mordecai. Then the king's fury subsided. I got to ask, was any of that in Esther's plan? Was she thinking, oh, when I say it's Haman, Xerxes is going to go outside, and then Haman's going to beg for his life. He's going to fall on the couch. It's going to look like he's attacking me, assaulting me. And at that very moment, my husband's going to back in the room. Didn't it? No, she didn't. She had no clue how people would react. She could not have planned or predicted the timing of that moment. That was not Esther. That was, that was God. And what are the odds that Harbona, one of the servants of King Xerxes, would just so have happened to have seen this giant 75-foot skewering, impaling pole outside of his house? And he would just so happen to say to the king, oh, yeah, the man that you just found out saved your life, Mordecai, that was actually meant for him. He, he fuels the rage and the vengeance of King Xerxes. That wasn't in Esther's plan. So how did all that happen? It's grotesque to think about, but as they took literally... Haman's flesh and blood body, and they held it above this massive sharpened pole and let go. That's what impaling was. How, how did Esther and Mordecai get saved? How did the villain end up dead and God's people end up alive? Well, the answer is Esther and God. Esther did not take a nap while Jesus took the wheel. She didn't sit in the back seat and wait for God to do his thing. She planned, and then God showed up with his plan. She took a first step, and then God directed the steps. That's what I want you to remember today. Write this down, please. That two truths, not one truth, but two truths, aren't a lie. If you're going to get your relationship with God correct, if you're not going to end up in one ditch, then you have to remember not one thing, but two things. And if you can keep two truths together, you'll end up with the whole truth. My friend Ben once described it like this. It's a piece of ribbon up here. Let's imagine that uh, there's a cliff here and a cliff here, and you're standing right here, and there's this massive, like, take one wrong step and it'll kill you kind of chasm. And here's the bridge. And if I attached that bridge on one side and said, go for it, <laughs> you'd say, uh, no, thank you. <laughs> I said, well, why not? You said, well, it has to be attached on the other side. And so I would say, okay. <laughs> you say, also, no, thank you. <laughs> and if you're going to get across, if you're going to survive, obviously a bridge has to be attached here and here. One, two. Put them both together and you have the way that the bridge works. Uh, and that's the way that your plans for life work too. Uh, you're either going to end up with missed opportunities for blessing or you're going to miss the blessing of peace and joy unless you can remember these two things. Write them down. We actually learned them from the story of Esther. Truth number one is that God has a purpose. All right, God has a plan. God has things prepared for you. You might not see them. You might not know them. You might not have anticipated them. But God has a grand purpose for your life. We call that providence. All right. So, real quick again, where are all my type A planner people at? Like me? All right. Some of us, we are way too stressed and we don't need to be. All right. Some of you come home at the end of the day and you're super frazzled and you're super mad because you wanted to do A, B, and C and then God interrupted you and he gave you D, E, and F. You don't have to feel that way. All right, you, you've fallen into the error of reminding, remembering just one truth, your plans, and God says, hey, I interrupt people. Sometimes I detour people. 
Sometimes there are people that I know need love and you didn't even know about them and so they weren't on your agenda. They weren't on your calendar. Sometimes you've done really, really great work that really helped people and you're stressed and you're frazzled because you didn't get your to-do list done. God says, you don't have to see life that way. Good days are productive days. Bad days are unproductive days. No. God has a purpose. In all things, God is working for the good and all things includes the things that weren't on your list of things. All right? So, do your best impression of a local hippie. So just take a deep breath. Say, all right, no calendar. I'm going I'm to burn my to-do list because God can work through all of that, right? And I want to say that especially to some of you who've been through some really hard things. Right? I, I know having a broken heart wasn't part of your plan. Uh, if you're a widow, I know him dying as early as he did wasn't part of your plan. I know maybe being single for this long or being single again wasn't part of your plan. I, I know being one of the many people who battles chronic anxiety wasn't part of your plan. I know struggling with fertility wasn't part of your plan. Going through the death of your father wasn't your plan. But you, you don't have to panic like your life is wasted because there are more than just your plans. There are the purposes of God and I want to encourage some of you today to become the kind of person who remembers that in all things, God works for the good. In that thing you're going through, he works for the good. In the most backwards, I never would have chosen this day, week, season of life, God works for the good. The situation you're in is not the exception. If you can remember this truth, it will give you so much comfort and so much joy. When you can say, God, you love me, you know better than me, like I didn't plan this, but you brought it right in front of me, so I'm going to embrace it, and I'm going to say again, in all things, God works for the good. That this too is a day that God has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And... And here's truth number two. Uh, the Bible also talks about your plans. That's a great passage from Proverbs 21. Uh, maybe some of you need to hear this today. It says, The plans of the diligent lead to profit as surely as haste leads to poverty. I love that. The plans of the diligent lead to profit. You want a profitable life. You want a, a blessed life, a prosperous life. What do you do? Well, this passage says you plan. You, you buy yourself a calendar. You make a budget. You think about before the end of the year, what do I want to accomplish? Don't just go to work, go to school. And, well, let's see what happens with my life. Now, think about who you are and where you are what God has given you. How can you maximize your impact on people and on the, the kingdom of God? Right? Be intentional about your life. Some of you know, like life goes way faster than you think. When you're doing your homework, the seconds tick by and then one day you wake up and you're 41 and you say, what happened? And you have a little kid and you're just changing diapers and <laughs> trying not to fall asleep in church. And then you blink and she's 14 and going to high school. Like life goes fast. We don't get to go back. And so God says, I want you to profit and the plans of the diligent lead to profit. So for some of you, your homework is to just sit down with a blank sheet of paper after church today and say, what are, what are my plans? Where am I going? What am I trying to accomplish? I'm going to make them as if it all depends on me and I'm going to hold these plans in open hands and say, but God, in the end, your will be done. Plan like it all depends on you. Rest like it all depends on God. If you hold those two truths in tension, that truth will set you free. Let's pray. Oh, God, thank you so much for the cross. I thank you so much that you, you just save us from arrogance and comparison and thinking those people are the real problem. Oh, that's just not true. Uh, it's a tough and a humbling word for us, but we need to hear it. God, when people are proud and think they're better, relationships blow up and cultures blow up and schools blow up. So thank you 
for being real about our sin and its seriousness. And we thank you a million times more for your grace. Uh, Maybe we want to minimize our sin because we don't think there's forgiveness if it's too bad. But the cross comes and just delivers this beautiful declaration that we're holding on to for dear life today, that Jesus Christ died for the very worst of sinners. He died for me. He died for us. And I'm asking God for the help to hold this tension. In the days to come, uh, help us to fight sin like everything depends on it. And if we do sin, God, help us to remember that it, it didn't depend on us. It was all about Jesus. Help us to hold this tension as we go through life, planning as best we can to leverage this moment, to make the most of this opportunity to love you and love people. And God, if nothing goes according to plan, help us to remember that you have a purpose, that you're a God of providence, that in all things you work for the good of those who love you. Uh, God, it's, it's tough to remember one truth. It's even tougher to remember two. So give us all the help that we need to do this well. God, your truth is a tension, a beautiful tension that we want to hold on to today. I pray that you bless us as we seek this, as we seek you, and as we seek to love one another in Jesus' name. It's in his name that we pray and all God's people said, amen. Do you find Jesus really interesting but kind of confusing? Maybe today you sense that God is working on your heart and giving you a new excitement about the things of the Christian faith, but you're not quite sure what to do next. If so, you're exactly the kind of person that I wrote this brand new book for called The Basics. Uh, It's not AP Bible, and it's not going to answer every question you have about Christianity, but it's going to get you back to the basics of why Jesus is worth following today and for the rest of your life. If you're interested, just go to timeofgrace.org to download your free copy. You can't tell God's story without the faith and fortitude of the women he uses to accomplish his purposes. The women of the Bible consistently rose to the challenges of their day and embraced God's purpose for their lives. The fact is, our culture and even the church has not always valued women, but God has, and he still does today. Real Women of the Bible, a new book by trusted ministry author, Dr. Paul Kelm, explores the character of some of the remarkable women in scripture, time and time again, reminding us that women play an absolutely essential role in God's plans. Each one of us today, both men and women, can carry the same legacy of faith. God values you. He sees you. He loves you. And the church needs you because God raises us all up to stand for him, live for him, and love for him so the world can know him. Be inspired by real women with real imperfections who use their specific time and purpose and accomplish really remarkable things through a big God. Real Women of the Bible is our way of thanking you for your financial support to help share how God has a purpose for each of us. Request yours today by visiting timeofgrace.org or writing us at P.O. Box 301, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, 53201. Time of Grace doesn't end here. Visit timeofgrace.org and explore encouraging resources or sign up for our daily email and have everything delivered right to your inbox. Like our Grace Moments devotions, Grace Talks devotional videos, blog, and podcasts. Follow us on social media where you'll find a supportive Christian community. If you need prayer, give us a call and let us know what's on your heart. Thank you so much for your support. See you next week on Time of Grace.